Ealing Animation for a bit, and then I worked back for um, Honeycomb. And the best thing ever happened to me when Malcolm Hartley rang me up to do some assisting for him. And I visited him at his studio. Well, sorry, Paul's studio. Paul's over Paul's there, Paul's studio. there. The collective studio. And uh, I, I just worked, did a bit of assisting for the day, and I, I was stuck at home. The worst thing you can do, actually, when you're animating, uh, you know, in a shared house, you've got the light box next to your bed, you wake up in the morning, ah, oh, first thing you the light box, you know, and uh, I was working on a TV series. I mean. So I asked Paul, I went, while we were there, oh, have you got any uh, a spare desk I could rent from you? So how much did you charge per week? Was it like two quid a week or something? It was something like two quid a week. Five, yeah, it was something. It was, God, it was so cheap. And that was such fun. And two of my best mates ever, I'm going to give you a hug. I love you so much. You know I mean? And we also, um, uh, Vanessa. For Vanessa, for Vanessa, for Vanessa, for Vanessa, for Vanessa, uh, Vanessa was, uh, who's here as well. So. We basically rented studio space, and that's such a great thing to do, yeah, you know, rather than company, being... We did a little bit of a company as well, uh, uh, and <laughs> I was, you know, you two are the talented ones, I was dragged along oh, on your no. coattails, no. believe me. So I, I got my first taste of directing professionally through you two, so I owe you so much. I'll give you a free book, there you go, so that's the reason. <laughs> oh. Okay, so... um. So yeah, I worked on various things w with you. We worked at uh, 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 a studio called The Warren. It was uh, near Warren Street. It was the uh, was it where um, Watershed Down was done. But by that time, it was you know we we were basically your stu uh, your studio was like in a corridor. So all the people at the place would come through our studio, go to the toilet, and back out again. You know it was not that great, but it was cheap, so it's good. <laughs> then we moved to Panther House in Holborn. Oh, yeah. yeah, a really shitty studio there. Um, but uh, you know, it's quite kind of fun and stuff like that. Uh, but um, in the meantime, I fell in love. Uh, uh, my girlfriend and I bought a flat together. We fell out of love. She left. So I was stuck in a flat in negative equity and finding it really difficult to actually pay for anything. So I was offered a job to work for Disney on a film called DuckTales the Movie. Okay? Um, it's a shit film anyway. But <laughs> what was good about that was I was about 28 at the time. So I'd been working, you know, eight or nine years or something like that. So, you know, when you're in the late 20s, you think you know it all. You know, that's the thing. You think you know it all. Within two weeks of working there, I knew I knew fuck all about anything. <laughs> so um, I'll show you a little bit of uh, stuff. I, I was assisting a guy called Bob McKnight, a brilliant animator, but God, he was a come to work for, to be honest with you. But I, I learned a huge amount from it. it, it, it I, I suffered, but I, I learned a lot. Anyway, so I'll show you a little bit of the, what I, uh, bit I assisted on here. So, um, let's see, does it work? So yeah, I, I, I assisted on all of this. Well, let me put it this way. You'll never catch me, Carpus. <laughs> Anyway, that's enough of that. You don't, that that's all you need to see. That's about it. Um, okay, so sorry about that. Uh, where, uh, where are we going? Uh, so, um, now, the weird thing was, you know, Disney set up a company uh, in London around that time, which was about 90, no, sorry, 89. I think the only reason they really set up a company here was after Who Framed Roger Rabbit, everyone in Hollywood thought, oh, you make an animated film in London, it's going to be a success. So, uh, Amblin set up a studio here. Uh, there was another one that was called uh, FR07, and you know, various other things. And I think Disney put it in there as a spoiler. You know, that's my kind of thoughts. Anyway, they were offering more money than Amblin or other places and stuff like that. And that's why I got took the job there because it was it was good money. But I must admit, I hated it. I really did not like working there. Um, after about six months, I just wanted to die. It was so bad. Uh, but um, sorry. To depressing on you like that. But um, strangely enough, um, after about, I think it was about 14 months, uh, the Disney people came in, uh, you know, because we, we, we were working in the studio on Penderfield Road, and then we moved to this proper studio <coughs> in Camden, very near where you live, actually. Next to Ian Eames's. No, 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 it was, um, uh, oh, I, I can't remember, near the canal, but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the other side. It, it wasn't on uh, 
Royal College Street. It wasn't that big over there. Um, so we, we, we all moved to there, and then um, they started to kind of, you know, we started doing like bits of TV series stuff like Winnie the Pooh and Duck, uh, sorry, Darkwing Duck and things like that. And then suddenly they all came and said, right, okay, we're shutting the place down. And uh, now the interesting thing was, having sold my flat, I bought a new house. And uh, um, does anyone know about buying houses? You exchange and then you complete. Anyone know about that? So, you know, you exchange contracts and then you complete, you finish it. Okay, so I was told I was made redundant in between that bit. Mm. Yeah. Can you remember, you know, you, you, you two came round to my house the first day I could kind have of moved in. So I, I, I finally managed to sell this bloody flat and then moved into this new little house. And uh, then I was told, you're redundant, you've got no work. I said, oh my God. But I didn't tell anyone, I just kind of moved in and see what happens. Um, so after that, I worked on a thing called Rover Dangerfield. Anyone heard of that film? No, anyway. Uh, no, it's actually <laughs> quite a nice film. Uh, it was released in America, it didn't make any money. I'll show you a little bit of it. So I did a little bit of um, uh, assisting on this. So, uh, oh God, come on. Uh, um, it, it's like... Hip hop my life in Las Vegas. I wouldn't change it for anything. I don't it. He's animation's newest party animal. It's a dog's life and I love it. Las Vegas is the place for me. He's Right, that'll do. Um, <laughs> it's actually quite a fun film. It's a guy called Rodney Dangerfield. Anyone heard of him? Yeah. 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 Yes. Offside kind of guy. Uh, he'd written this <coughs> thing and it was, you know, him doing the voice of the dog. It's actually quite a nice film. Um, so I worked on that for Tony Collingwood's studio for about six months. God, that was hard work. It, again, it was assisting on it, but you know, it, it, it was you know, really hard work. Then. Um, I got laid off from there, and then I had a chat with a lady called Shelley. Shelley's last name, I can't remember. McIntosh. Shelley McIntosh, yeah. She was working on effects of, uh, on this really weird bloody film called FRO7. Anyone heard of FRO7? Yeah, you have, yeah. It's a bloody odd film. I actually quite like it because it's so weird. It's so bloody weird. It's a film that was uh, uh, written by a guy called Jon Ayevsky, who was a... Uh, um, Where's he from? Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia. Um, and he'd managed to get some money. He, he, I think, you know, he'd, he'd come up with these stories that he'd entertain these kids, you know, when they were going to bed and stuff like that. And he managed to get some money to make this film. And I only got there right at the end of it, you know, when it was going to be finished. And I managed to get a job for a guy called um, Pete Chang. Now, Pete Chang set up a company called Double Negative. Ding -ding. Uh -huh. Later, you know, but he was a really good special effects animator, and what's you know what's really nice was actually working for him. You know, he was young and exciting and stuff like that. So I did a little bit of work on that for about you know six months or so, um, and uh, this 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 clip will show you just how bloody weird this film is. Um, where's it gone? Uh, I've lost it. Uh, oh God, what have I done? There you go. That one there. So I did. Sparks, smoke, and uh, fireworks in this. It, it was the only time I've ever done special effects. It was quite fun to do. Um, for the last shot, I was animating on a piece of paper that I had won. Like that. It was so big. Yeah, for this big pullout. Anyway, so ignore you know any of the uh, camera animation. Sparks and the effects are mine. So. <laughs> But it's a weird bloody film. It's worth watching because it's so bloody weird. <laughs> Hypnotize. 
I'm going to pull it a lot. Yeah, let's go along. OK, we need... Uh, right, OK, we need the long shot. This is really, yeah, it's really difficult to sit through this film, it's so bad. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so, you know, I, I spent about three years doing feature films. It's not really into it, you know. Um, anyway, so, um, after that, um, I, again, okay, went back to Bob Godfrey's work for a little bit, and then, you know, came back and worked with you two. And, uh, from that point, um, what have we got? Uh, I think, no, that's a bit, what have we got? Real. Uh, okay, so, um, oh, yes, this is the last bit of, uh, I want to show you this one. I think this is one of the, oh, uh, one of the best things I've ever worked on. Um, and it was designed and directed by that man over there, Paul Stone. There we go. Um, it was so lovely to work on this, you know, um, because it's so beautifully simple and yeah basically all the stuff that's good is Paul's and it, you know the basic stuff is mine anyway I can't remember I think I did about the first half I think something like that I did yeah. animate it didn't yeah. I I think yes okay but let's watch you the I, bits. yeah and um you sniff, sniffy sniffy doggy bit anyway this is such a lovely film it's amazing you know um and it was so I've met people who actually watch this at school, you know, so I think it's lovely, you know. I know so. We meet thousands of different types of antibodies for each different type of virus. Uh, so, um... If a gang of viruses revisits your body, the antibodies will recognise them and zap them. <laughs> If they're strangers, I, I know, I know, I know, new antibodies will be made to attack them. Can you remember which ones you did? These new antibodies that's, will be on standby in case the gang revisits. Vaccines but they're all Paul's designs, so, yeah, so they will worship Paul. And make a stand by army to thing. attack them. Yeah. But some viruses are smart. This they can change shape or disguise or hide inside normal cells. Ah, this is Paul. This is your. You did the funny stuff. Cells, you know, you chose the funny stuff for yourself. Like yeah. this dog. This is brilliant, look at this. Okay, Paul Stone, this, you know, worship this guy over here. It's brilliant. Look at this beautiful. Thank you, Steve. They warn the system to make the right kind of antibodies. Developing a vaccine yeah, against HIV this. is difficult because the virus is the smartest of them all. It uses disguise and changes shape and hides inside cells. At first, the sniffer dogs are good at warning us to make antibodies against HIV. But after a while, HIV invades them and multiplies. The new HIV viruses kill more T helpers. And when most T helpers are dead, the immune system can no longer defend itself against disease. Isn't that brilliant? I love that film. I love it so much. You know, does anyone think it's good or rubbish or shit or something? I think it's a brilliant film. Yeah. Paul! Paul, you directed it. It's cute, it's cute. I really love doing that one. Uh, what have we got? Um, around the same time, I worked on. Uh, where's it gone? Where's it gone? Uh, see, moves. Oh, I can't find it now. Where's it gone? Uh, no. Uh, oh. Okay, there, there was a Kellogg Smacks thing I could show you, but let's not worry about that. <laughs> anyway, so um, so basically, um, it was around '94 that um, uh, Roger Noak, who was a, a farmer, he asked me to oh come in and um, do you fancy doing some teaching? I said, oh, that'd be nice. You know. And over the summer, he sent me some details about what I was meant to be teaching, stuff like that. And I, you know, chained up on it, worked it all out, and stuff like that. So I turned up on the first day in, in late September. 
and I said, oh, Roger, hi, hello, how are you doing? I've uh, been looking up all this stuff you've sent me. I've rehearsed what I'm going to say and stuff like that. And he went, oh, why were you sent that? We're not doing that, we're doing this. He handed me a different piece of paper. Okay. And then he said, also, oh, oh, Steve, the other tutor who was going to be with you today, he's gone to the dentist, so you're on your own. And then he took me to this room that was full of 40 really angry-looking second years <coughs> and said, um, oh, hello, everyone. This is Steve Roberts. Uh, he was a student here. He's been working for about eight years. And over to you, Steve. With that, he ran out of the room. <laughs> so I, I had this piece of paper in front of me I'd never seen before and went, bah, bah, you know. There were people getting up and walking out and there. All I remember, that's the first time I ever taught. I'd never stood in front of a group of people before, you know, I, uh, you know. And um, I spoke for six straight hours. What I said, what happened, I don't know. I just, I just talked. My jaw ached at the end of it. I, I don't know what happened with it, you know, but, uh, it was scary, it was frightening, but I found it amazing as well, you know, that, that was the thing about it. So thank you, Roger Noak. Um, so I always, you know, if someone comes in to teach at Central I say, always make sure that they brief properly, <laughs> I'll be there and stuff like that, I don't want to put any, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, if you're going to teach something, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah just fucking get on with it. <laughs> but, you know, uh, God almighty, you know, so that was the, that was the first time I ever te uh, started doing teaching. And um, it was really kind of interesting, you know. Um, so it's, what's that, mid-90s, mid I was, uh, you know, working at various other places, and stuff like that. Um, uh, through Paul and Mal again, you know, Paul, you sorted out this kind of uh, job with a BBC company, was it? Um, Cat Size, wasn't it? You know, we were meant to do mm. 20 or 30 short films. We did about six, I think, in the end, bastards. <laughs> you know, they, we, we killed ourselves doing a couple of pilots to put in their, 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 their pilot films. And they said, oh, yes, we're going to do one for each episode, you know. So we thought, oh, we were set up for, you know, two years doing directing short films. And it, is, and, and it was down to Paul and Matt. They were established directors. I wasn't, you know, I was the one, you know, dragging on your coattails. Uh, so it's really lucky that I kind of was able to do that. Um, I think I directed about three of them, you know, and we did about, what, six or seven altogether, you know. Anyway, so we did a bit of that, this, you know. Um, anyway, so um, what we're going to do next? Uh, Maybe I can show you um, uh, some of the... Oh, there we go. So, uh, all right, I'll show you this one. Um, I animated this. Uh, this is probably one of the last... Um, like, Brittany Silk commercial I've ever worked for. And I think I had about 70 percent So, um, not this shot. There's the previous one. Every, every other shot from here on, I animated. Um, the director put a vest in white light and my lips in. You know, I think we've got good lips in. And there's a nice thing to work on that one. Um, although, I think Kitty Taylor redid the arm on that because I couldn't do the arm properly. But it was really interesting. Uh, Paul Vester, um, who was the director of his company of Speedy Films, he actually said, OK, we're going to try and do a remake of um, Enter the Dragon. And he said, uh, here's a copy, here's a video of Enter the Dragon. Go home and watch it, you know. And normally you'd say, oh, great, go home. But having watched Enter the Dragon, God, I earned my money that day. It's a bloody awful film. <laughs> uh, but, um, <laughs> but it was interesting, you know, he wants so many things in it. And of course, as we're sending stuff to the USA, we get feedback back. and. Um, this huge Edge of the Dragon film got shorter and shorter and shorter because they've got the pack shot longer and longer and longer. Yeah? This is the thing about, uh, you know, flogging. Um, the most important shot is... Uh, where are we going? That's, that's the most important shot. Yeah? Flogging the sugar-based drugs aimed at children. That's, that's what it was. <laughs> so, um, that was done in 96, I think. There was something really, there used to be loads of stuff like this done, you know, during the 80s and 90s. But a big thing happened in 1995. You Can you? No, no, Toy Story. Toy Story, oh. bloody <laughs> Yeah, Toy Story, 3D, Toy Story, you know. So, Roger Rabbit, you know, could have, um, 
you know, the Hollywoody looking, you know, um, drawn animation went out of fashion almost overnight and everyone wanted, you know, 3D to do stuff like that. <coughs> so in many ways, you know, a bit poor, poor, poorly or fall asleep. <laughs> so in many ways, you know, the, you know, the film you directed, that um, uh, AIDS, AIDS film, you know, that was more what I ended up doing after that. You know, something that looked more like drawings, not trying to fake stuff, but like drawings, you know. But, you know, it was just great, it was fun. So, um, so what I'm going to show next? Um, there's, there's not much to say, really. Um, after that, having got a little bit of experience with doing directing, um, where are we going? Uh, I ended up, like, you know, working for there's a really lovely guy called Tobin Goff, um, a guy I was at college with. Again, Tobin actually died of cancer. Um, uh, 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 when was it? You know, um, uh, 2015, I think, or something like that. But he was like working at um, various design companies and stuff. So he'd often give me quite a lot of work to do. Uh, so that's when I moved more to directing. Um, so uh, what have we got? OK, so um, let me just show this one here, Pop Sushi. So this was a little thing that Tobin came up with, and um, it was uh, like a Japanese kind of character. So, And those behind the scenes that make it happen, plus I get to meet them. No, 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 I get to meet those folks that I really, really fancy, and you get to talk to the big teasers in so, music. That's quite a fun thing to work on. Um, there was a, um, uh, you know, loads of different things like that. I mean, there were half-hour shows, so they, like, reuse all the bits of animation and stuff to put them together. Um, another one here. Uh, where are we? Uh, da, da, da. Sorry, this one. Again, um, what I found often was um, people were not asking me to colour things in. I'd just supply the animation, and they colour it in After Effects or something. So this is one here. Um... <laughs> You know, that's um, a time sequence for a, um, uh, come, uh, for a TV show. Um, and, uh, oh, okay, this, this was one I got from a company called um, The Edge Picture Company. They do quite a lot of corporate videos and stuff like that. Now, what's great about this video, okay, so what I'll tell you about this, I think it was the first time I worked for them. Um, they wanted to do... Um, originally a live action, you know, it's, it's for a B, British Telecom video magazine, you know, to give to work and stuff like that. And um, originally they were going to try and go around to British Telecom um, uh, offices and stuff and interview happy workers, but they found all their workers are so unhappy, there's no point trying to do that. So a guy sat in an editing booth, came up with a few... Um, uh, doodles, and they said, right, edit the doodles, all right, so, uh, sorry, animate the doodles, so I animated all the doodles. And what's great about this film is that I was given 5,000 quid to do it, okay? Um, I managed to animate it in two days. Ooh. I This was the first movie I ever got coloured digitally, so I gave it all to Jeff Goldner to colour with um, uh, Animo. Animo. So, I earned 4,000 quid in two days. Okay, so that, it, it's never happened again, believe me. It's the only time it's ever happened. Anyway, so let's show you this. In, in a, in, uh, so this is what you can do if you're... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, so um, I basically did that by um, drawing up, you know, some of his doodles and then 
running over to the news agents had to photocopy it and then photocopying things up and down and things. It's all done on paper, and then delivered to the, um, the company that digitally scan it and then colour it in like that. And uh, yeah, so, um, and then uh, it cost me a thousand quid to get it coloured in, so I got my four thousand quid. And what did I do with that four thousand pounds? Did I invest in learning new software or buy a computer and stuff like that? No, I went out and I bought a um, 950cc, 150 mile an hour Triumph motorbike, basically. <laughs> so that, yeah, that's it, rock and roll. Um, so that's what I did, basically. I'm a very shallow person. Um, so there's a few other things here. Uh, uh, all right, I'll show, I'll, I'll show a bit of this one. This is um, another kind of corporate video I did for the same company. This is really bloody annoying because... Um, Again, when I first pitched on it, um, it was going to be the start and the end of, you know, people going round various places, you know, Electrolux companies all over the... Uh, you know, Electrolux owns Zanussi and AEG and various other kind of companies. So it was going to be um, interviews with, um, you know, happy workers and stuff like that. But I couldn't, I had to, you know, basically they handed me a book of Mel Cowman's illustrations and said, oh, they're going to be giving a, um, a, a Swiss army knife that's got a lecture knife room on it. Okay, we need to, something like that. And I couldn't think what to do. I thought, right, okay, so I actually wrote a script. I wrote the script, then I could do the design. So, and then I storyboarded it. Uh, the agency, you know, the Edge Picture Company, um, took it, they showed it to the Electrolux people, and uh, I think uh, Electrolux is a Swedish company, and it's the son of Mr. Electrolux. He saw that and said, why are we going to film all these people? Why don't we do it all as animation? So suddenly it went from being, like, you know, maybe 20 seconds, you know, 40 seconds or together, to being a four-minute film. And I went, oh, fuck, how am I going to make that? So the way I did it was... Um, Mel, you worked on it, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. Um, what happened was, basically, luckily, the course I was teaching on finished almost the day I needed to start work. It had to be done in two weeks, basically. So what happened was, all the people I'd been teaching, I said, OK, tomorrow, uh, you know, Monday, come in, I've got a job for you. So all 15 of the students I've been teaching, two do do. I said, right, OK, there you go. And I you know, paid them all properly and stuff. So. But the annoying bloody thing is, I know the Edge Picture Company got about 50,000 for it. Mm. Uh, they did nothing. I got 24 to actually do it. And by the time I paid everybody, I think I walked away with perhaps 2,000 quid for what was like four weeks of hell, basically. That's all I can say. But it, it was nice to work on. Anyway, so um, so this is, the, I suppose, the first thing you could say is my, that was written by me and designed by me. So I'll show you this. Where are we going? And when do we have to finish, Martin? Tennis. Tennis. Okay. Uh, 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 right. Uh... Okay. Should be. Yeah. Okay. After I'll, I'll, I'll get into my my own personal thoughts. We can go over a bit. This has won lots of awards, amazingly enough. You know. Um, and a lot of the people who worked on it. Um, I've all gone on to work in you know, various bits of the industry. Um, Jeremy Zarr did that. He's, he's, he worked um, in uh, NBC in Canada. Oh, yeah. 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 The other thing I found interesting about this film was I hardly animated anything on it because I'd actually laid it all out and put it all together. And I hated it, of course, you know, by the time you've done all that, you hate it. And then, but when I saw other people animating it, I thought, that's really nice. Is that yours, Mel? Is that your one? Yeah, there you go. So. Uh...
admitted it there. He said that I worked for, uh, yeah, French stuff now. Yeah. Again, this one got into Annecy in competition, and also um, Espino and stuff like that. swiftly along. Um, maybe the only thing I'll, I'll show you here. Um, this was one, um, again, for the same company, um, and uh, I, I'm gonna, I won't show you all, it's really boring, it's sort of Tesco's and stuff, but I think it's the first thing I did in Flash. You ever heard of Flash? It's now called Animate. I hate it. I hate Flash. I know Mal loves it. Is this the first thing you ever did in Flash? Yeah, that's it. What was great about this, you learnt Flash, I love, you know, anyway, I'll show you a little bit of it. Um, uh, and it's all designed by me and uh, so, Mrs. Jones, uh, but, so um, nowadays she's a busy guy who animated uh, this one, uh, they never used Flash before, he's been working for Google right? for quite a long while. Okay, uh, okay, okay, so let's move through this, da, 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 da. oh, uh, dancing, there we go, um, 20 um, they're all my designs, bloody awful, but um, oh, where's, uh, I quite like the car driving there, I like the car driving. Oh, car, waiting for it, even more of a shot in the We've never used Flash before, no. Um, what happened was, um, they said, oh, we've got this thing for Tesco, and, and they said, um, can you do it in Flash? And you know you use Flash, don't you? Um, yes, I do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I rang up someone, uh, someone and said, for God's sake, I need to have to learn how to use Flash. So, uh, the next thing that came out, in, in basically two hours, taught me the absolute basics of Flash, so that was it. Anyway, you don't need to see any more, it's, uh, it's dreadful, but, um, it's one won awards as well, I think. Anyway, so, um, it's really easy to win awards with, you know, shit like that. Anyway, so, um, then there's a really big gap, basically. Um, had children, got married, never really uh, was able to do anything, uh, you yeah, um, spending time, more, more and more time spent teaching. But, um, in 2013, um, uh, Tom, Tom Lowe, got in touch with, with lots of people and said, do you want to make a little film about, you know, what was it like working with Bob Godfrey? So I just wrote a list of all the funny things that happened when I worked for Bob Godfrey. You know, some of us heard of Bob Godfrey. You know, maybe not, I don't know. He did a thing called Henry's Cat. Have you heard of Henry's Cat? No one's heard of Henry's Cat. Oh, yeah, never mind. It's in the style of Henry's Cat. It's done in Flash because it was the easiest way to do it. So, um, there we go. Where is it gone? If I can find it. So, um, I did this one. Uh, there we go. So, let's put this one on here. Um, there we go. I even did the music for this. Let's see that. So, uh, one song. Dean Roberts woke up on a bright sunny oh. morning. Oh good, he said. It's Saturday and I don't have to go to school. I can spend all day watching cartoons and making things out of cardboard boxes. 
He went downstairs and switched on the TV. His mother called from the other room. Why don't you put on BBC Two? There's a program about how to make cartoons. Oh, no. Not BBC Two. That's boring, said Stephen. Stephen turned it on. The do-it-yourself film animation show. And there on the screen was a man with a big moustache and his glasses hanging around his neck on a piece of string talking about animation. His name was Bob Godfrey. He showed how to make animation the most wonderful thing to do in the world. He showed how to do animation with rubber toys. He showed how to do animation with flip books. With a man called Terry Gilliam, he showed how to make animation like Monty Python. With a man called Richard Williams, he showed how to do animation like Bob Disney. He also showed how to do animation like Bob Godfrey. <laughs> Bob said that what a proper animator needs is a Super 8 Cine camera with single frame release. Well, all of this was amazing. Stephen never knew how cartoons were made. So as soon as the show had finished, he tested his mother for a Super 8 Cine camera with single frame release. Stephen's mother visited Dixon's on the high street. The sales assistant said that the Super 8 Cine camera with single frame release would be about £90. Now this was a huge, almost unimaginable amount of money, and far more than Stephen's parents could afford. Stephen's hopes of making cartoons were dashed, but he was given Bob's book at a prize giving at school. Stephen coloured all the pictures in and started doing flip books in the back of his exercise books. Stephen would always go to the cinema to see any animated films when they were released. He did this in secret because if his classmates found out, he would never live it down. Although other interests came and went, Godfrey always seemed to be at his shoulder, reminding him about animation. Suddenly, Stephen got to try some animation when he was doing a foundation course in art. He bought a cheap Russian second-hand standard aid camera with single frame release and he did some animation. But his head had been filled with being an artist. He wanted to be a painter, a printmaker or a sculptor. Stephen started a fine art course at our college and looked deep within his soul and found there was nothing there. After two weeks, he dropped out. When his mum came to pick him up, she handed him the local newspaper. In it was a job advert that said, Wanted, college dropout to work in animation studio. Well, this was amazing. Stephen applied for the job and got it. The job involved sitting at a kitchen table, painting cartoon characters with sheets of plastic. The two people he worked for knew Bob Godfrey and had been taught by him at college. Stephen decided he wanted to be taught by Bob Godfrey as well. So he applied for the animation course at the art college at Farnham where Bob Godfrey taught, and he got in. Finally, Stephen got to meet Bob Godfrey and got him to sign his book. Bob was much older than on the telly, and now he wore his glasses rather than having them on a piece of string around his neck. Stephen changed his name to Steve and settled down to learning to be an animator. Bob Godfrey taught all the students valuable lessons like tax evasion, how to avoid drawing too much, and how to make anything funny. How to do key positions with nothing in between and how to go to the pub, how to hate Margaret Thatcher, and how to use a peg bar. One student was too mean to buy a peg bar and animated by lining up the pages, one to the next. Bob made the joke, I know a student who animates with no peg bar. How does he animate? Terrible! When looking at one of the students' animations, Bob said, Where did you learn to do lip sync? Steve Roberts showed me. Bob replied, Talk about the blind leading the blind. When Steve made his final film, it was about a love affair between Ronald Reagan and Maggie Thatcher. Bob loved the film so much he gave Steve some money to finish it. Bob also gave Steve his first job when he left college. Bob's studio was based in London's fashionable Covent Garden and was easy to find because it had an effigy of Margaret Thatcher hanging from the top window. Bob's studio had lots of signs and posters and knickknacks and pictures on the walls, as well as two BAFTAs and an Oscar that were kept above the sink with the tea bags. While Steve worked at Bob's studio, Bob received an MBE from the Queen. The Queen asked Bob, Oh, well, what do you do? I'm an animator, Mama. Oh, 
so you're what an animator looks like. Apparently the Queen had said exactly the same thing to Bob ten years before at a garden party. He came back from the palace in his smart suit and his medal on display. Later, on the way to celebrate Bob's medal in the pub, we passed Richard Williams' animation studio on Soho Square. Bob gave him a respectful salute. <laughs> Around this time, Bob Godfrey was not speaking to his writer, Stan Haywood. There was an argument about the money that was being earned from Henry's cat. Stan was having a meeting with the producer on the ground floor of Bob's studio, and Bob was up on the top floor avoiding him. Bob really needed to go to the toilet. Was that to get to the toilets, you had to walk past where Stan was. So Bob had a wee in a milk bottle and asked his top animator to take the bottle and tip it down the toilet to the people's <laughs> men. Polite refusal. Steve even had a go playing cricket with the Bob Godfrey 11. He scored a golden duck. Steve tried drawing Henry's cat, but was always ended up getting things wrong. Either giving him square feet or too big a head or putting in too many drawings. Many was the time that Bob would go through Steve's animation early in the morning and throw out most of the drawings. The animation would still look just as good, if not better. There would often be a dreadful smell coming from the drains below Bob's studio. This could result in the entire studio smelling like poo, and the camera person in the cellar would often have to wear a gas mask. There was nothing that Bob liked better than rummaging around in the drains trying to unblock them. Bob would often get visited by celebrities from stage, screen and labels. Have you got any work in any research? Bob, could you spell us a quid for a cappuccino? Bob was always pleased to see them. <laughs> Steve moved on to work at other studios, including feature films for Disney and Warner Brothers, and one that had a strange frog in it. Bob's studio in Covent Garden was closed and reopened as a reasonably priced shoe shop. In the meantime, Bob's studio opened up in the up-and-coming King's Cross area. After three years working on feature films, Steve was laid off. His first job back in City Street was at Bob's studio and it felt like a breath of fresh air after the restrictions of working for Hollywood. Although it might have been the newly fitted air conditioning, Steve was always impressed by Bob's modern attitude to animation and media and how he always had a project on the go. Later, Steve started teaching and would often consult Bob on how to do various things. Steve now teaches all his students valuable lessons like tax evasion, how to avoid drawing too much and how to make anything funny, how to do key positions with nothing in between and how to go to the pub, how to hate David Cameron and how to use a peg bar. I could have saved the whole first half just by showing you that, couldn't I? Yeah. All that crap you meant to sit through. Anyway, so. Right, that'll do, that'll do. Uh, anyway, so, we've got that there. Um, yeah, so, um, it was really nice to actually do my own film. I think I did that about four weeks, you know, over the summer and stuff. Um, anyway, so, uh, what I did was, um, after that, um, I... Basically, I, I and my wife, you know, uh, having been so unsuccessful at, you know, getting anything into film festivals, there was a thing called the Walthamstow Arts Trail, and uh, we set up a cinema in our front garden. I just set up a, you know, a, a little gazebo with a projector and stuff like that. So I showed that film. Uh, Dee, my wife, showed a couple of her films that she'd done. You know, she's done, like, workshops with kids and things and also the art films and stuff. And then there was another film I showed, because I discovered that a guy called J.K. Starley, have you heard of him? The man who invented the modern bicycle. Okay, what? he was born. The modern bicycle. Yeah, oh, yeah. The, the safety bicycle, you know, diamond shaped frame, wheel, you know, wheels the same size at each end, you know, um, crank in the middle. And he was born in Walthamstow, only about, you know, two or three hundred metres from where I, I, I live. And no one's heard of him. And I thought, right, OK. So I made this little um, little kind of movie. I just downloaded stuff from the internet. It was about three minutes long. I just showed it at this thing. And Chris, you came to visit. You came to look at it. You did. Yes, you had to sit through my films. You showed it here. Uh, yes, I did. You did. Yeah. Well, um, no, 
not that one. Oh. Uh, this was an earlier one, a really crude one with photographs I downloaded from the internet, so three minutes long. Um, and uh, what was good about that was um, a guy um, who works for the Poetry Society. Oh, I can't remember his name. Uh, anyway, so, uh, some, someone I know, he, he came and watched it. And then he was in a meeting at the local council and someone there said, oh, we're going to be doing a, a, an exhibition at the local museum about J.K. Starling, who was born in Walthamstow, just to kind of emphasise this. And he said, oh, I know someone who's made a film about that and would be good to that. So I, I, I went to see them. I um, showed the little film I'd done and I said, you know, basically, I'm, it's not going to look like this. I want it to be a bit like um, Bob Godfrey's film, Great. They didn't know I was talking about that. I want it to be a bit like Spike Milligan or Monty Python, straight over the head. A bit like horrible histories. Oh yeah, that's great. And I, and, and I, I said, and I'll get someone from, one of the actors from Horror Histories to do the voiceover. That's yes, brilliant, you know. So I got the job, you know, and th I think they only wanted a three minute film or something like that. Anyway, I ended up making a 13 and a half minute long film uh, because I wanted it like great. So. I thought, right, I'm going to write some songs. I wrote, wrote four songs for it. Um, I managed to get people to help me sort the music out and stuff like that. So it's a bit like, you know, if anyone's seen Bob Goddard's film Great, which is about Isambard Kingdom right now, it's got music and dancing and stuff like that. All right, I'm not going to inflict the 30 minute film on you. Uh, I'm going to inflict the five minute version on you now. So we'll do that quickly. So we've got, uh, where's it gone? Okay, there, five minute version. So, um, this is it, really. So, uh, and it was uh, narrated by John Howie. Was born in Wolverhampton. John Kemp Starley. Ever heard of him? Didn't think so. J.K. Starley invented one of the most important forms of transport ever: the safety bicycle. Yeah, man. <coughs> if I might just cut in here. Give me a bicycle. You need a bicycle. It really is the business if you want to get around. My song, I wrote a bicycle. I didn't sing this one. It is the best way to perambulate. I have found some bars at the front and a diamond frame, a crank in the middle, and the wheels are just the same. The chain from the crank connected to the wheel, and a big leather saddle for a nice, comfy feel. You need a bicycle, you need a bicycle. It really is the business if you want to get around. You need a bicycle, you need a bicycle. It is the best way to perambulate by a foul. John Kemp Starney was born on Church Hill, Walthamstow, on Christmas Eve, 1855. As a boy, he was a studious child and took a keen interest in the new technology of the day, steam trains. JK was offered an apprenticeship with James Starney's company in Coventry. The first rover bicycle they produced had remote steering, far too complicated. The second version was simpler but too delicate. The third version set the fashion to the world. This basic design has remained unchanged for almost 150 years. The bicycle became a huge craze in the late 19th century. The bicycle led to the biggest diversification of the gene pool in the world. People could travel further to so fully. Now you got to hear me singing. So. Get on the bicycle of love, and if it's a bum. You'll find a spouse, set up a house and fly high like a dove. If life you want to straddle, then jump up on the saddle of the bicycle of love. It's always said that in springtime, a young person's thoughts turn to love. But if you check out the local talent, they can often turn out to be a bit rough. And if you want to diversify the gene pool, Finding someone new can be tough. So what you gotta do is seek out pastures new and get on the bicycle of love. Get on the bicycle of love and ever to love. You'll find a spouse, set up a house and fly high like a dove. There is no better way to exchange your DNA than on the bicycle of love. Of course, JK didn't invent two-wheeled transport. The first device was the hobby horse, or Dresden, invented by Baron Karl von Dres in Germany. This was heavy, 
made of wood with two wagon wheels and was scooted along with the feet. Great for going down hills, but exhausting going up. In France, Pierre Michaud and the Olivier brothers attached a pedal crank to the front wheel of a hobby horse, and the velocipede was born. Again, it was heavy, but it was easier to propel than just your feet on the ground. In England, it was found that if you made the front wheel bigger, you could go a lot faster. And this is where James Starley's ordinary bicycle, or penny farthing, comes in. After that, it was down to J.K. Starley to make a bicycle that appealed to all. Women were able to travel and experience the world on their own for the first time. This contributed to modern feminism and the suffrage movement. Here I am, right down the street. I'm on my bike and it's such a treat. I've got the freedom of the neighbourhood. I go anywhere and it feels so good. I'm a hot young woman on a bicycle. I don't need a man to live a life that's full. Here I am, as cool as an icicle. With a neat bed like a fish, these are bicycle. We created the suffragettes. We want the equality you can bear. We may end up in prison, creating modern feminism. I'm a hot young woman on a bicycle. I don't need a man to live a life that's full. Here I am, as cool as an icicle. With a neat bed like a fish, these are bicycle. J.K. died at the tragically young age of 46 in 1901. J.K.'s basic design looks almost like a modern-day bicycle. You cannot say this of other forms of transport. The Wright Brothers Flyer looks nothing like a modern aircraft. The first car developed by Carl Benz looks nothing like a modern car and much more like a horseless carriage. The bicycle has changed the lives of people all over the world and is going to be even more important in the future. The end. The end. There you go. So, um, so yeah, that one, um, oh, oh, wait, oh, God, hang on. Um, so that, that, strangely enough, won Best Animation at the Walthamstow International at, uh, Film Festival. Although, because, yeah, the, the thing I found about, I think, film festivals is, know the people who run it, basically. <laughs> I bumped into the, the people who ran it at a car boot sale. I said, I've made this 30-minute film. I said, well, well yeah, we only want five-minute films. So I did a real hard cut, and that's my five-minute version. So anyway, so that's my award-winning film. Anyway, so... Anyway, so... Um, through, through Stephanie there, we started doing a lot of puppet animation. I started teaching puppet animation myself. Put you out of a job as well. What a bastard I am. Anyway, so, um, where's it gone? Ah, here we go. So, I remember, um, I made this little puppet of, S oh, sorry, uh, Sid James. Uh, where we go? Uh, there we go. There we go. And Martin, you got in touch with me. You said, oh, you're having, a, you know, one Monday night, you're doing, um, you're going to be showing, you know, bring bring your own films to it and stuff like that. I think you got in touch the Friday or the Saturday and I thought, oh, I'll make a film. <laughs> so I, I had this Sid James puppet. So on the Sunday morning, I just went through YouTube, found some interesting Sid James quotes. And then for about three hours in the afternoon, I just animated them. So this is the first ever puppet animation I ever did. Okay. And um, it's probably the best one I've ever done anyway. Anyway, so watch this one. So, uh, so three hours in the afternoon, so. <laughs> anyway, so, that was, uh, I think I spelt Kenneth Connor wrong there. Anyway, so, so that's the first bit of pop animation I ever did. Um, anyway, so, um, I, uh, the next, the same year actually, um, has anyone seen the film called The Darkest Hour? One Gary Alban won an Oscar for, the last Prince of Churchill, yeah? I was very, 
usually I say it's a shit film, but no, I was very disappointed by it because I thought it might be pointing out what a twat Churchill is. You know, people don't realise what a cunt he was. You know, sorry to use the word cunt, but he was a cunt. Anyway, so my working title was Winston Churchill, what a cunt. Um, uh, so I thought, right, okay, I need to make this. So I'd made this puppet of Winston Churchill. I storyboarded it all and then it was done over an eight week period over the summer. There's two weeks in the middle where I took a holiday, but it's quite good because it meant I could actually think about it a bit. Anyway, so um, we've got this one here. So um, you might have seen this one, I'm not sure. The Rangers. The Rangers. Winston Churchill is often considered to be the greatest Briton, but was he so great? Who, his speeches during the Second World War, galvanized the British people. His opposition to Hitler and fascism were admirable. But did you know he was also a white supremacist who did his utmost to preserve the British Empire? In the process, he was responsible for the deaths of millions of people. Churchill was born with a silver spoon in his mouth at Blenheim Palace in 1874, the grandson of the Duke of Marlborough. He was a particularly poor scholar at school, failing all his exams. His parents followed the tradition of the British aristocracy by sending the idiot of the family into the army. After his third attempt, he got into the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst. It was here he was trained to keep the people of the British Empire at heel. He also developed his theories about the superiority of the white British race. He was posted out to the Empire and had great fun laying waste to entire villages in the Swat Valley in what is now known as Pakistan. I also killed several savages in the Sudan. It was while here he became a journalist and started writing for various newspapers, portraying himself as a hero. He became a conservative member of parliament in 1900 and a Freemason in 1902. Being a self-serving turncoat, he became a liberal MP in 1904. He was opposed to women's suffrage and described it as a ridiculous movement. He advocated eugenics and selective racial breeding and the sterilization of the feeble-minded. During the First World War, he became Lord of the Admiralty. He orchestrated the disastrous Dardanelles naval campaign. The result was hundreds of dead British sailors. He was involved in the planning of the military landings at Gallipoli. This resulted in the deaths of thousands of Australian troops. In order to resuscitate his career, he served in the First World War, while still a member of Parliament. Like most officers, he spent most of his time as far away from the action as possible. In Ireland, he instigated the use of a group of evil thugs called the Black and Tans. These laps were used to suppress the revolution there with excessive violence. He advocated the use of poison gas to quell a revolt in Kurdistan. As an MP, he happily accepted bribes from oil companies. When it suited him, he rejoined the Conservative Party. Anyone can write, but it takes a certain ingenuity to rewrite. In 1924, as Chancellor of the Exchequer, Churchill oversaw Britain's disastrous return to the gold standard. This resulted in deflation and unemployment. It ultimately led to the general strike of 1926. Yeah. During the Second World War, almost by default, Churchill became leader of Britain. In order to divert German fighters from British airfields, he instigated the bombing of civilian targets in Germany. This led to the Blitz. In Britain, I'm always amazed at how popular I am with the British public when I visit bomb sites, considering it was I that put them in this position. In 1943, he starved Bengal with the export of rice from the area as a famine took hold. He prevented Americans from delivering food to the starving people. This resulted in the deaths of millions of Indians. If food is so scarce, why hasn't Gandhi died yet? He was desperate to keep India as part of the British Empire and hated Mahatma Gandhi. He said, I hate Indians. They are beastly people with a beastly religion. India only gained its independence when Churchill was thrown out of office by the British people. When back in power, he hated the immigration of West Indians and suggested that to keep England white was a good slogan. When the Kenyan people revolted, he was responsible for them being herded up and put into brutal gulags, killing 11,000 and detaining over 80,000. 
one being Barack Obama's grandfather. Ultimately, his resistance to Hitler was because he wanted to protect the British Empire. But his speeches inspired countless people to seek freedom from the British Empire. Consequently, his prose worked against him. So basically, you know, that was that was done in my garden shed with thirty quid's worth of plasticine and um, everything, you know, using um, photographs I've downloaded from the internet for free and stuff like that. Um, anyway, so uh, where are we? Um, that was in yeah, that was 20, 2018 I did that one, and I remember going through a really bad period um, personally, mentally. Um, stuff like that, late 2018. Um, so I remember writing this bit of prose, you know, I just, I just wrote down some stuff about um, I'd uh, filled out some, you know, forms from, you know, the Guardian website about, you know, ADHD and autism, and I seemed to be uh, showing signs of having both of those. So I got in touch with uh, the local uh, mental health. Uh, air, uh, authority, you know, and they kind of saw me, uh, but then it took ages and ages and ages to actually get to the next kind of bit of that. Um, and um, I, I just wrote this in, almost in frustration, in, you know, in late um, 20, 2018. And then, um, strangely enough, I was actually asked to go to a festival in China. It was like a charity festival, and that was, you know, a lot of the concentration was, was on autism and ADHD. And I spoke to a mate of mine, Tim Webb. Anyone knows Tim Webb at all? Mm. I've heard of Tim Webb. He made a film called A is for Autism, wonderful film. And I emailed Tim and said, Oh, is it all right if I, you know, could I show your film at this festival? And he said, Well, actually, I'm going to this festival myself and I'll be showing it. So I'm like, Oh, shit, I've got nothing to do and nothing to show. So I thought, Right, okay. I'm going to make a sodding film. So uh, I basically, I started. I started at about the start of March. We were. I was due to fly to uh, China at the end of March. So this film was done in um, 21 days. Okay. Ooh. So uh, it's just based. You know, and uh, while I was still working at college as well, so I'd get up at four o'clock, do three hours. And then you know do work and then do the same thing, put in a you know a couple of long weekends and stuff, and um, great because um, I also um, I, I know quite a lot of people who um, are students at the um, Royal College of Music on the film composition course, and I, just, I sent an email out to them saying you know is anyone interested in doing. Um, uh, some music for film for me. And the thing I found about the Churchill film, it's it's a bit flat, isn't it? You know, list, 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 list. It's, it doesn't build up to a nice crescendo and stuff. So, right, I, can, I want to do something that's got a slow, fast, slow, fast. And I thought, right, okay, the music I like, okay, so something like either Song 2 by Blur or Smells Like Teen Spirit by Nirvana, something like that, you know, more like Song 2 by Blur. So, um, so basically I started doing this. I didn't even storyboard this one. I just had a list of, you know, what I'd written. I just wrote down what I thought would happen. There was lots, there was going to be lots more kind of morphing and things. That wasn't time. So it's just lip sync and stuff like that, mainly. Um, but yeah, so this one, um, it was done really quickly. And what was great was, you know, I did my little presentation about the course, how, you know, teaching people that with ADHD and autism and stuff like that. And I showed this at the end. And other, you know, tutors from other colleges all around the world, they did their, you know, things that usually talked about their college and stuff. And they showed these beautiful films that are so quiet and beautiful to look at. And the volume was turned up quite loud in the <laughs> cinema. Okay. So I showed them my stuff and then I put this film on. And it was just kind of, ah! You know what I mean? It, it, everyone's all jumped out. Anyway, so I'll show you this film. It needs to be viewed loud. So, um, uh, uh, why am I a bit odd? Uh, oh, 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 oh trailer, sorry, sorry, sorry. It's a, it's a, yes, trailer. So, where's the other? One? There, there it is. Sorry, I showed the wrong one. I've ruined everything. Okay, so let's go for it. Uh, this film was made in March 2019. 
By this time, I'd waited almost a year to get a diagnosis for ADHD and autism. About three quarters of the way through the production, I was diagnosed with ADHD and prescribed Ritalin. Why am I a bit odd? It's taken me 50 years to work out that I'm a bit odd. I think most other people have thought I was a bit odd. At school, I learned to disappear. If people couldn't see you or notice you, you wouldn't get bullied or beaten or ridiculed. Inside, I wanted to be seen. It took me so long to do what I wanted to do. Everything I've ever done has taken a huge effort to make myself do it, like pulling teeth or drawing blood. Waking up feeling pure fear, shaking, sweating, feeling life was this horrific place of abuse. Worrying what people think of me, not being noticed, trying to be ignored was safe. So I think I'm a bit autistic, or a bit ADHD. I filled out the forms on the internet, I filled out the forms for the doctor, and now I'm just waiting. What if I do have these things? What if I don't? I had an interview. Sit, How should I act? Should I act odd? Should I just be me? Should I calm myself down and be somebody else? My whole life is an act, an effort. I don't feel like I'm being me. Apparently I'm showing symptoms of both ADHD and autism. Am I just normal? Now I'm waiting for a full assessment. It feels like two bits of me are fighting each other and I'm stuck in the middle. And still I'm waiting. The drugs, the drink, the nicotine. And still I'm waiting. Psst! He's just taken some Ritalin. It's a controlled drug. His animation's gonna be a bit rough from now on. The obsessions, the collecting, the spending. And still I'm waiting. The suffering I've put my family through. And still I'm waiting. On the 16th of January 2019, I crashed. I crashed and on the sofa and couldn't move. Finally, I managed to pick up the phone. In the I saw the doctor. I got the pills. And still I'm waiting. shows films I was really embarrassed that one I'm not embarrassed at all I don't know why you know it's weird you know the, the, the other ones anyway so um like I said it was just so funny seeing these beautiful kind films and my one's going you know like that um and uh, the thing I found is you know, uh, um, you know I've entered into loads of festivals I've been so unsuccessful at getting films into festivals you know or getting money and stuff I've got to a point where fuck it I don't give a shit basically so I'll just do things that I feel like doing um now uh, uh so so most recently um okay that last year um actually you know for a couple of years but and last year um, one of my students was um, doing a film about a drunken Irish woman who would go to a bar and sing a, sing a karaoke song. So I wrote a song for her, and then the musician you know, gave me the backing track for it. And this student didn't use it, you know. 
I'd previously also written a song for a, another student and they didn't use it either, you know, so they, I should be learning something now. Don't write songs for students because they don't want them. They don't want me to write songs for them. But anyway, so I thought, right, OK, I've got this song. It's got a backing track to it. So I thought, right, OK, I'm going to give it to my current students and get them. So we've got a person singing karaoke and then on the screen will be bits of animation that um, my students have done. OK, so this little project, it's not finished yet because um, if anyone's interested, I've got three shots. If anyone wants to have a go at animating, you know, come, come get in touch with me. So I'm going to show you this one now. Um, the other thing I'd say about this is uh, I, I sort of, it's, it's kind of my tranny coming out film because I do cross dress um, occasionally. So she's me, she's me, it is me basically. So um, anyway, so let's watch this one. This is my little test thing I did first. Of her. It needs a fact, yeah, it's not finished, it's not finished. So. Um, 
I've, I've built this kind of puppet here. Again, this is um, so ready cash, so kind of puppet there like that. Um, so I'd actually cast the head, so I needed to test the head. So I did this little movie in a, again in an afternoon. Really. So um, it's all very kind of. Actually, um, um, Dave, David, I remember like, playing the, music, the piece of music to you, you know. Anyway, so, um, here goes, so, I've um, got this one here, so. Uh... Bloody Disney, fuck off. Anyway, um, so, um, yeah, that, that was a sorry. I've got an idea of, um, you know, doing that. So, um, the last thing I'll show you now, it's nearly over. Don't worry, it's nearly over. So, um, my idea, you know, this, this is the first thing I do kind of after, you know, and uh, um, anyway, so, and then it may, hopefully, what's going to happen is I'm going to cast. Wanda there in rubber, and then she's going to meet Ready Cash or Johnny Cash, and they're going to go on a road trip of some description. Anyway, so this is the last thing I'll show you now, and that's it. So um, this is the last thing I've done. So. Um. <coughs> She's going to go to America, but I like the idea of her actually getting really drunk on the plane, and getting dumped like Lubbock in Texas, and then meets Brady Cash, and then they go on some kind of road trip. I'm, you know, I've not thought anything more than that, really. You know, so I'm just going to go through. Um, so yeah, I think that's a lot, really. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, enduring my stuff, and uh, that's it. Great. So thank you. I was going to say, yes. you brought some stuff with you. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, I've, I've, uh, I've brought, yeah, so, um, so that, that's me, that's me from the film. Um, the last shot I did was actually where there's the two characters punching each other. Yeah, in, in, the, 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 in the background, kind of in the middle. So he got rather smashed up, you know, you find the plasticine characters. Uh, we've got Churchill here and uh, all the replacements. Do you want to turn the light on? I can turn the light on. Go around there. So you can have a look at like, all the replacement mouths and stuff like that, how I've kind of built him up. You know, like that. Um, I, uh, I brought in Mahatma Gandhi as well. Um, I'm, I'm so proud of Mahatma Gandhi. That's probably the nice thing. Oh, you've broken it. You've broken it. No, um, <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Um, I did that about three hours, I think. I was so pleased with that. You know, it's, it's oh my god, you know, most of my stuff looks a bit shit. I thought that was really nice. I, I was quite glad it looked nice. Uh, I couldn't bring in Barack Obama because I sliced him up to make him go up and down. Um, then we've got one there. We've got um, 
uh, ready cash here. So uh, again, that's um, the puppet that I made uh, um, that was um, cast uh, in uh, latex rubber. And it took several goes to get one to work properly, but you know, you can work the mouth and stuff like that. So ideally, Wanda is going to end up being a bit like this, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, he even, his quiff can even move like that. Like that. Okay, so, um, yeah, so. Yeah. Come and have a look at these and see what's going on. This is a, a little puppet that I made um, for the book. Basically, I had to, you know, put together a really simple kind of puppet and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, things like that, really. Um, and also, I've got a few examples of, like, you know, different ways you can articulate mouths. So, it's like a hinge one there. And, um, you know, I tend to use like replacement mouths quite a lot as well, so um, you can stick like a little mouth in like that, or different ones. These are carved out like really soft foam. It's actually the kind of stuff you would um, you actually insulate houses with. You know, you can find it in skips. You know, that's what I do. It's quite soft, but you know, you can quite do quite a nice stuff with that. Is um, that stuff the expandable foam? No, this this is um, it's not. this is stuff I found in skips. You know that um, you. You know, if someone's doing a lot of oh, you carve they're usually, it. Yeah, just carve it, yeah. So, yeah, um, with, um, with this guy here, yes, we put the expanding mm -hmm. foam in, you know. Um, but then just carved like that. And then these are, um, you know, uh, not latex, they're silicon, but, you know, hands that I've made and stuff like that, you know. So, um, anyway, look at those, really. And tell um, us about your book, Steve. But the book, okay, so yeah, the book, I was, kind of, I was meant to start it, uh, was it August 2019? August 2020, I can't remember. I'm losing, no, it was about August 2019, I think I was meant to start it. But um, ended up, uh, you know, not starting it then. Uh, so I'm a twit. And um, uh, rushing it and then um, just about finishing it three months late. Okay, so I finished it. Um, so you can't see them over there. <laughs> that, uh, and uh, yeah, so, so basically the book has got, um, it's about 2D animation, um, 3D puppet animation, and uh, it's, it's, it's a very practical kind of book, I think, you know. And, uh, you know, I previously did a, a, a book before that was very techy about, you know, using 2D animation, how to relate that to uh, 3D programs and stuff. But this one, I've, I've tried to keep it as as untechy as possible, though it does talk about Blender. And uh, I, I remember Fogel Press, the people who I um, previously did the book for, they said, oh, we've got another um, another idea for the book. And I said, well, I remember seeing a book, I think it's the 80s and 90s, called The Gorilla Guide to Filmmaking. Anyone heard of that one? Yeah. You know, it's, it's how to make a cheap film, cheap feature film. I thought that'd be great, well, a gorilla guide to animation, you know, how to actually do something quickly and cheaply. Um, and of course they weren't interested because, you know, a focal press isn't interested in, you know, relating things to various bits of software, you know, how to use flash, how to use a camera and stuff like that. So, they weren't. so this is kind of like nearer to that kind of book, I suppose, you know. Um, Crowwood Press would publish it, very small kind of publisher. Who's the publisher? Crow, Crowwood Press, it's called. Crowwood? So, Crowwood, yeah. They, they do lots of craft books, you know, scrapping, macrame, model aeroplanes, model train sets, you know, stuff like that. Uh, so it's very crafty and stuff, so that's what I've done really. So I've just knocked out how to do an animated film as cheaply as possible in whatever technique you want. So that's about it. Exciting another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.